welcome to uh, our deep dive into consciousness, mm -hmm. but not just any exploration. No, no. We're going full on Douglas Hofstadter today. Oh, yeah. You've shared some excerpts from his book, uh, I Am a Strange Loop. Right. Plus bits from its uh, index and notes. And frankly, I'm I'm already feeling my brain do loop de loops just thinking <laughs> about it. <laughs> well, it's a it's a good kind of loop. Trust me. Yeah. What's what's so captivating about Hoshkatter is that he doesn't shy away from the big questions. Yeah. He dives head first into connecting consciousness yeah. to mind bending concepts like strange loops, self-reference and even even Goodall's incompleteness theorem. Right. Like, how do you even begin to wrap your head around that? But that's that's what we're here for today, to break down these complex ideas. Absolutely. See what they reveal about the very nature of ourselves. And what better place to start than with Hofstadter's early insights? Well, Hofstadter had this almost rebellious realization as a as a young man. He saw consciousness not as this concrete thing, but as a sort of mirage. OK. Like a a self-perceiving illusion almost. He even wrote a whole dialogue about it when he was just a teenager. And get this, the characters are named Plato and Socrates. Yeah. Teenage Hofstadter was clearly not messing around. That's that's pretty amazing. Yeah. And in that dialogue, there's this there's this line that just stops you in your tracks. Thus, now, if you say, I know I am alive, that sentence is merely a reflex coming from your brain and is not a product of conscious thought. <sighs> OK, that's that's deep. If something as fundamental as declaring you're alive is just a reflex, right. what does that even, what does that say about all the other things we think and feel? What does it even mean to have a self at that point? Well, that question sparked a lifelong quest for Hofstadter to understand the self. Right. Initially, he was obsessed with connecting Gödel's incompleteness theorem to the human brain. Okay. Which eventually led to his groundbreaking book, Gödel, Escher, Bach. But hold on, before we go full on math whiz, sure. let's talk about this other concept that Hofstadter explores, soul size, a term coined by the critic uh, James Hunnaker. Now, Hunnaker was a bold one. He claimed that some people just don't have the soul size to truly appreciate, let alone perform certain works of art. It's, it's true. He even went so far as to say that small-souled men, no matter how skilled they were, should never attempt to play Chopin's fiendishly difficult Etude Apu 25 number 11. Wow. Okay. Strong words. But it does make you wonder, do we all implicitly believe in this idea of soul size, even if we don't use that exact term? Right. Like, do we sense that some people have a greater capacity for empathy, compassion, or even just experiencing the world more deeply? Well, that's, that's the crux of it, isn't it? Hofstadter uses soul size to nudge us into considering how our capacity for connection might directly influence how much we get out of life, out of art, out of everything. Okay, that's that's a much more thought-provoking way to think about it than just judging someone's soul. But then, then how do we even begin to explain how something as complex as consciousness arises in the first place? It's like one minute you've got neurons firing, and the next you're co contemplating the meaning of life. Right, it's, it's mind-boggling. And this is where Hofstadter introduces this idea of levels of description in the brain. Okay. He says we need to consider both the micro level, you know, the buzzing of individual neurons, right. and the macro level, the emergence of thoughts, feelings, and actions. Gotcha. He actually uses a, a, a pretty cool analogy to illustrate this. Imagine a giant thought mill. A thought mill. A thought mill. Mm -hmm. Think of it as this amazing contraption powered by what he calls symbols, these, these tiny balls representing ideas, and sims which are the physical structures of the brain. So these symbols are like the essence of thoughts bouncing around in our heads, yeah. interacting with the sims, the actual physical matter of our brains. Exactly. And depending on where you look in this thought mill, what level you're focusing on, you'll see different things happening, different kinds of meaning and cause and effect relationships. It's about perspective. That's, that's fascinating. But how does the sense of I, that feeling of being a unique self, even begin to emerge from this, this chaotic thought mill? Yeah. It seems almost impossible. And yet it happens. Yeah. Even in creatures that we wouldn't typically consider self-aware in the human sense. Uh, Hofstadter points out that dogs, for example, display a rudimentary sense of I. Really? My dog mostly seems concerned with uh, where the next treat is coming from. Of course. Sure. But think about it. Your dog knows its kale is part of its body. Right. Not some random object. That's a basic self-model. A sense of me versus not me. Huh. I never thought about it that way. It's like they have a little internal map of themselves, even if they can't explain it. Exactly. And for us humans, this self-model becomes much more elaborate and nuanced. Mm -hmm. It's built through our interactions with the world, 
our memories, our relationships, all constantly shaping and reshaping who we think we are. So it's not just this static thing, our self. Right. It's constantly evolving, like a work in progress. Precisely. And this constant process of meaning making, of figuring out who we are and how we fit into the world, relies heavily on a powerful mental tool analogy. Ah, the trusty analogy. Always there to save the day when things get too abstract. Right. But Hofstadter takes it a step further, right? He sees analogy as fundamental to how we think and understand the world. Absolutely. He argues that we use analogies constantly, often without even realizing it, to grasp complex ideas and make connections between seemingly disparate things. He has some great examples in the book, like comparing a straying wife to a straying cat. On the surface, they're totally different situations, but there's a shared underlying structure of betrayal and transgression. It, it goes even deeper than that. He breaks down the seemingly simple phrase, grocery store checkout stand. To show how it's packed with layers of implicit meaning, referencing everything from grocery carts and scanners to tabloid headlines and credit cards. It's like our brains are constantly creating these intricate webs of meaning, weaving together ideas and experiences through analogy. Exactly. And this brings us to another fascinating concept that Hofstadter explores, video feedback. He actually conducted experiments where he pointed a video camera at a TV screen, creating a recursive loop. Now, this might sound like something out of a sci-fi movie, but bear with us. What's so amazing about these video feedback loops? Well, what Hofstadter observed is that these loops often produce these incredibly complex self-stabilizing patterns, uh, a phenomenon he calls locking in. Wait, so just by pointing a camera at a screen, you can create these patterns that seem to have a life of their own. That's kind of freaky, but also really cool. It is, and what's, what's remarkable is that these patterns emerge spontaneously from the simple act of feedback. They become their own justification for existence, almost as if they're saying, look, I'm here, I'm real, and I'm not going anywhere. It's like they're pulling themselves up by their own bootstraps, defying the need for some external explanation. Right. And this self-referential quality of video feedback loops, it, it reminds me of something else we were talking about earlier. You're thinking about Godel's incompleteness theorem, aren't you? Exactly. There's got to be a connection there, right? But... But before we dive into the wild world of Godel, let's take a quick pause and then we'll come back and see how all these pieces fit together. Sounds good. All right, ready to tackle Godel? Let's do it. His incompleteness theorem is is considered one of the most profound discoveries in mathematics mm. and for good reason. Mm -hmm. It essentially proves that even within a perfectly logical system, like arithmetic, right. there will always be some statements that are true, mm -hmm. but impossible to prove within that system. Whoa. Okay, so you're saying there are truths out there that we just can't definitively prove, even with all the logic in the world. Exactly. It's yeah. it's like having a puzzle where, you know, a certain piece fits, but there's, there's no way to demonstrate it using the rules of the puzzle itself. Okay. I'm starting to see why this theorem is such a big deal. But how does it actually work? It all sounds so abstract. Well, Gödel came up with this ingenious method called... Uh, Goodle numbering. Okay. Imagine giving each word in a dictionary a unique number. Right. Goodle did something similar with math, assigning a unique number to every symbol and formula. So instead of writing out complex equations, he could represent them with numbers. Precisely. And this is where it gets uh, really clever. This numbering system allowed him to create mathematical statements that essentially talk about themselves indirectly through their assigned numbers. Oh, I see. So it's like a secret code where the numbers themselves contain hidden meanings about the statements they represent. You got it. And by using this technique, Goodall showed that within any sufficiently complex system, right. you can construct statements that are true, but can't be proven within the system's own rules. It's it's a self-contradiction. Wow. A paradox that, that shook the foundations of mathematics. And now I'm, I'm seeing the connection to consciousness. If math can have these self-referential statements, maybe consciousness is a similar kind of loop happening in our brains. That's, that's precisely what Hofstadter suggests. He argues that consciousness is inseparable from thinking. And this thinking, in turn, is full of self-referential loops. Remember those symbols bouncing around in the thought mill? Oh, yeah. They're, they're not just representing external things. They're also reflecting on themselves, on the very process of thinking itself. So it's like our brains are constantly having a conversation with themselves, generating thoughts about thoughts, yes. creating this recursive loop that gives rise to the sense of I. Exactly. And and to explore this idea further, 
uh, Hofstadter presents this playful dialogue between two hypothetical strange loops, which he calls SL tag 641 and SL tag 642. Okay. They have this whole back and forth about how the sense of I emerges and what it implies for free will. And spoiler alert, he basically concludes that free will, as we traditionally think of it, might be an illusion. It's, it's a controversial idea for sure. Yeah. But what's what's interesting is that Hofstadter doesn't see this as a bleak conclusion. Instead, he suggests that even if our choices are determined by a complex web of causes and effects, yeah. the subjective experience of making those choices is still real and meaningful. So it's not about denying the the feeling of agency we have, but understanding yeah. its complexity. It's like, okay. yeah, maybe our brains are these incredible biological machines running a program, right. but we still get to experience the joy of the ride. Exactly. And this leads us to another fascinating aspect of Hofstadter's thinking about the self. Oh, okay. The idea that the boundaries between selves are actually much blurrier than we typically assume. Wait, hold on. Are you saying our sense of I isn't confined to our own heads? Mm. That it can somehow extend beyond our individual brains? In a way, yes. Hofstadter believes that memories and experiences can be shared and transmitted between individuals. Okay. Creating a kind of interconnected web of selves. Okay, now we're getting into some seriously mind-blowing territory here. So you're saying that our eye is shaped not only by our own experiences, but also by the experiences of those we're, we're deeply connected to. Precisely. He even shares personal anecdotes in the book, mm. uh, like his experience of feeling intensely connected to his deceased wife, Carol, right. through shared memories and the feeling of being her in a certain sense. He also talks about feeling a sense of telepresence while working remotely with a colleague as if their minds were merging into one. Wow. That's that's both beautiful and a little spooky. It's like we're all part of this larger network of consciousness, sharing and reflecting each other's experiences. That's that's a great way to put it. Mm -hmm. And and this brings us back to that idea of soul size we discussed earlier. Mm -hmm. Remember how Hunnaker said only those with large souls could truly appreciate certain works of art. Right. Like you need a certain depth of understanding to connect with the artist's intention and emotions. Exactly. Hofstadter takes this idea further and suggests that soul size might also be about our capacity for empathy, compassion, and connection. Okay. The larger our soul, the more we can step outside of our own narrow perspective and experience the world through the eyes of others. So a large soul isn't just about being smart or sophisticated. It's about being open to the experiences and perspectives of others, expanding our sense of self to encompass a wider range of emotions and understanding. That's a beautiful way to frame it. And, mm -hmm. and Hofstadter uses the example of Albert Schweitzer, a remarkable humanitarian who dedicated his life to serving others. Mm -hmm. He also raises the question, is there a connection between soul size and the ability to be moved by profound art, like the music of Bach? It makes you wonder, doesn't it? Does a greater capacity for empathy and connection allow us to experience art more deeply, to to feel the echoes of the artist's soul in their work? It's it's a question worth pondering for sure. But but it's important to remember that the idea of soul size isn't about ranking people or or judging their worth. It's it's about recognizing the potential for growth. Right. For expanding our capacity for understanding and connection. I love that. It's like we all have this inner potential for soul expansion, for mm -hmm. becoming more attuned to the complexities of our own minds and the interconnectedness of all things. It's, mm -hmm. it's pretty inspiring, actually. It is. And Hofstadter leaves us with one final thought-provoking idea that really drives home this point about interconnectedness. So we've We've journeyed through Hofstadter's mind-bending world of strange loops, self-reference, and even pondered the, the size of our souls. It's been quite a ride. It has. It has. What's, what's the final takeaway? What's that parting thought that's going to leave us contemplating the universe long after this deep dive is over? Well, Hofstadter quotes this incredibly poignant line from his book's bibliography. Okay. Consider how profoundly wrapped up you can become in a close friend's successes and failures, in their very personal ecstasies and agonies. What are you doing but living their life inside your own head? Wow. That that hits close to home. We, we all have those people in our lives, right? Where where their wins feel like our wins, their heartbreaks shatter us too. Right. It's like it's like we're experiencing life through their lens as much as our own. It's, it's such a simple observation, yet it, it speaks volumes about the nature of consciousness and how deeply interconnected we truly are. It, it suggests that our sense of self, our I, isn't this isolated entity confined to our own skull. 
So it's like we we carry pieces of other people's experiences within us, shaping our own sense of who we are. Yeah. And and they carry pieces of us too. It's it's kind of a beautiful thought when you think about it. It is. And it challenges us to reconsider those rigid boundaries we often place around ourselves. It suggests that consciousness is more fluid, more interwoven than we tend to believe. So as we wrap up this deep dive into Hofstadter's world, what's what's the one thing you hope our listener walks away with? I, I think the most important takeaway is this. As you continue to explore Hofstadter's work, or even delve into some of the sources he mentions in his notes, keep questioning. Keep contemplating the nature of your own consciousness. Mm -hmm. How do you experience this feeling of I? Where do the boundaries of yourself begin and end? And how are you shaped by the experiences and connections you share with others? Those are those are questions worth pondering for sure, because ultimately, the journey of understanding consciousness is a deeply personal one. Right. It's about looking inward, but also recognizing that inward might be a lot more expansive and interconnected than we ever imagined. So until our next deep dive, keep exploring, keep questioning, and keep expanding those souls of yours.